Hey, it's Ron Jones II, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Tuesday, June 23rd, the Fantasy Footballers back with you. Mike Wright here in studio. Yes. With me, Andy Holloway. And then the best remotely joining us this fine day, Jason Moore. Howdy. We, (laughs) with the howdy, we, uh, as you know, can only take so much of Jason on a regular you know, week to week basis. So mm. from time to time we ask him to just record remotely for just, just go away. For well we that's You're what we human. want, but we don't always say it like that. Yeah. You guys are really kind hearted and just better people. So um uh, than me and I'm happy to be where I am, uh, still allowed to participate from a distance. Yeah. From a distance from a distance that's, is kind of can our, you have has has the phrase from a distance no. ever been spoken without immediately nope. thinking it's impossible from a distance <laughs> <laughs> welcome Who's, into the show who sings that I, I don't even know is it bet midler oh, is, it, is it midler uh, i don't know We're, I yeah we have the important midler. stuff we yes, need to, it's it's bet midler we have to get to the bottom it is, of this. is bet midler. Midler. Yeah, right. it is that's the official uh the music <laughs> I can't video from a distance, I, I, I there that. is harmony, from a distance. and it echoes through the land, Mike. <laughs> yes, it does. We need that song right now. <laughs> we need that anthem. The world? We need that anthem. It's the voice of hope. It's the voice of peace. It's the voice of every man. I just like that mm. it's the, from a distance, and we need yeah. to keep our distance <laughs> we, right now. <laughs> that song is perfect. <laughs> Bette Midler, thank you for being uh, timeless. Oof, a prophet. <laughs> Bette Midler. Can we go back to when Bette Midler <laughs> was uh, the jam? Which, when she was a oh. Sanderson sister? I just know we she didn't have COVID to deal with at the time. beneath my wings, I know that. She what? was the air beneath Jason's wings. <laughs> yeah. Okay, not the start I expected. We have sleepers and values on the show today. We have some news we have to get into, some of which breaks my heart mm. to have to talk about. We have the Ultimate Draft Kit now available at ultimatedraftkit.com. Head over there, check it out. Dollar from every UDK going to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital once again this year. Uh, we've had to make some adjustments. I say it, it, the UDK saw its first real, real time update, which uh, came yeah. because of an unfortunate s- circumstance. We've got an injury to talk about on the show. Yeah, we 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 had to make some Dalvin Cook tweaks, some risk tweaks last week as well. You can find the show on YouTube, youtube.com slash the fantasy footballer. Subscribe, click the bell. Appreciate everybody who supports the show by reviewing on Apple Podcasts, listening on Spotify, ad-free on Stitcher Premium, wherever you're listening, we appreciate you. Quick question of the day. Comes in from Tom in Ohio. Jason, he wants to know, uh, why is Aaron Jones ranked so high with the Packers drafting A.J. Dillon in the second round? He's our consensus running back six right now. I have him at nine, Jason at nine, Mike at six. Last year, over 1,000 yards, I believe uh, he had about 75 touchdowns, right? Yeah, Eight, give, or take, give or take a few. So why is yeah, he ranked so, I, so high? What is your answer to this question from Tom? Well, I mean, look, we all, every everyone here knows that Aaron Jones is going to have touchdown regression. And by everyone here, I mean everyone in, on the planet. Uh, he had 16 <laughs> rushing touchdowns. I everyone at your house. Sorry. <laughs> He had 16 rushing touchdowns, added another three through the air. That That's not going to happen. He was the running back, depending on scoring form, and I think two or three um, last year. And so, you know, we know that's not going to happen. But sometimes those negative arguments make you feel like, well, he's – He's no good. He's great. He's actually a really, really good running back. Uh, you know, there, there's a reason he ran for 4.6 a carry and was highly effective in the red zone. And, you know, he's a very good running back. He's still the clear lead. And I view Almost AJ Dillon. Almost 500 receiving yards, too. Yeah, I view AJ Dillon as more of a threat to Jamal Williams. Now, yep. he will eat in a little bit to Aaron Jones, and I think all three will be 
more involved than fantasy football owners would prefer. But at the same time, you know, I have Aaron Jones going from 236 carries last season down to 216. So I've got him losing 20 carries, half the touchdowns that he had from the year before. But that's still a really, really good number. I mean, that still puts him in my top 10. Uh, I do worry about consistency. He was very much not a consistent running back last year. There were certain games he would disappear from. But at the end of the season, I think he's going to be, you know, certainly a top 15 running back. And that's not outlandish considering he was, you know, a top three running back last year. Yeah, two comments that I would add. One, Aaron Jones' ranking is also based on our confidence in other running backs in the NFL. I mean, his ranking Mm -hmm. is kind of corollary to whether other running backs can step up and be more valuable for your fantasy team. My second comment is that what a sad place to be in where last year it's like, oh man, if Aaron Jones ever got enough work, he would dominate. Oh man, Aaron Jones dominated. Let's lower him because he dominated too much. Right. He's, yeah, he's a great running back and he also, he caught 49 passes. Like he, he's still going to be involved in the receiving game as well with, so if, uh, even with A.J. Dillon coming in, Aaron Jones is still the leader of the running back room. A.J. Dillon doesn't come in and take that away from him. So he's, he's still a top option to me. We're giving away a jersey of his teammate, Devontae Adams, at FootClanGiveaway.com if you want to check that out. Let's talk some news. News and notes from around the league. <sighs> Bad. Debo Samuel suffered a broken left foot during a workout with teammates on Tuesday of last week. He'll be sidelined three to four months. Debo suffered a Jones fracture. That's an eight to 12 week recovery timeline. Mm -hmm. (sighs) I've seen 12 to 16 out there as well. 12. uh, I've, I've seen both timelines given for this injury. Sure. Um, it, it, it seems that the, the eight to 12 is a little bit more common for wide receivers, which is, which is good, but that puts it like, if it's 12 weeks, if from the day he had surgery, 12 weeks is the exact day of the kickoff of the NFL season. So that's the idea of the timeline is, is, you know, he could be ready for week one if he misses everything leading up to week one. Yeah, I mean, you have to make adjustments to your view of Debo. I mean, he's a he was a breakout candidate for us statistically. Mm-hmm. Emmanuel Sanders left, Debo coming into year two. The way they use him, you know, he is a running back as well. He is a screen game uh, player, and here he is with an injury that affects your explosiveness that takes a long time to recover from, and that has a 15 to 20% risk of a second injury you know, a second right. surgery that could cause problems to his dynasty value, that could cause problems to his explosiveness coming back. This is just altogether unfortunate news. Yep. And so now what do we do moving forward? He was projected to be the number one wide receiver for the 49ers. Uh, I would, I would, in my projections, I went in, I think I took away, you know, one to two games, but it which isn't a lot so he's it's not like he's completely off your draft board now there's going to be a spot where he becomes a value even though he has a, a much higher risk rating what did you guys do uh, in terms of filling in those gaps so like who who got a bump for San Francisco yeah i mean i i think the un you know we'll talk about Brandon Ayuk Ayuk but I don't think that, you know, when you have a rookie coming in and the window of opportunity is these first few weeks of the season, I believe the team is just going to distribute the ball across a number of options, including the return of Jalen Hurd this year, including Trent Taylor's return, who they talk up every offseason, who always (laughs) is hurt, but he's currently healthy, and including the guys like Kendrick Bourne and ultimately the number one true wide receiver Mm -hmm. on the team is George George Kittle. Oh, Oh, come on. I, you, I was trying to get you to say his name. I will never speak that name. <laughs> if you think I'm speaking, he who shall not be named. Come on. Pet, Pettis. Dante Pettis, no, baby. No. Let's go. No. Pet, Pettis season? No. Hey, he's no, there. J- he's ready. Jalen so Hurts Put me season. in, coach. 
No, I, I agree. I'm, I'm with Andy when I when I redistributed. I took two games away from Debo because I think that that's accurate in the sense that even if he comes back week one, this injury in the first year and, and specifically immediately following the return, you have a long history of a lack of production up to 50 percent. Uh, so you're, you're you're you know, if he's out there week one, he's not going to be in my lineup week one coming off of this injury. So uh, I took two games away, but it, it got redistributed um, to where nobody really is the clear beneficiary. It's it's uh, everyone gets a few more targets over the course of the season. Uh, didn't change my rankings all that much. Jimmy Garoppolo lost a little bit here, uh, but it's sad. It's sad for a, a guy who Andy was, you know, probably going to have as a my guy, but it is worth noting and realizing with this injury that you know sometimes it takes these moments to make us look backwards i was going to give a shout out to jared smola's tweet here is that what you were going for yeah absolutely go get, you you do it well you know just a few days before this injury jared smola on twitter at smola ds debo samuel's injury history remains concerning 2015 missed seven games with a hamstring 2016 three games with a hamstring 2017 10 games with a broken leg 2018 he was healthy Last year, the numbers he put up, that was in 15 games. He missed mini camp with a hip injury. He missed week seven with a groin injury. Had a shoulder injury in November. And now he has a Jones fracture. Mm. So, you know, this is something to concern you in the dynasty projections for Debo Samuel mm -hmm. to have year after year of injury. Well, and let's say, I mean, because of this injury history and the specific injury, look at a dynasty outlook that starts like this. He comes back, plays for you know a, a good portion of the season but he's not that valuable this year his production is down and then he is in the 20 percent re-injures it has to get surgery again y you know you could be talking about you know a, a two-year window before you really get the guy that broke out as a man um <laughs> do i get a hit at one more can i hit it yeah, one more time i feel like we need sure. to i feel like it needs some now you're a man. He's like oh, and way he's a sad distortion to <laughs> yeah. it. That's the last time we'll get a play for a while. But just for the ranking sake, I think I had him at 17 or 18 before the injury. He's sitting around 29, 30 right now. Uh, there is a additional risk to him. And he was a player that was going to need to put up numbers, not just in the passing game. This was not a high, you know, right. uh, passing volume type of team. So it, it's just, Unfortunate. It's part of every off season. We never know who it's going to be. Mm -hmm. But now it's a man. <laughs> yeah, I have Debo at thirty three now. There you go. There you go. Uh, Richie James also broke a bone in his wrist on uh, in that wide receiving core that now does not have Emmanuel Sanders. And Des Bryant is tweeting uh, eyeballs at the Forty Niners again. <laughs> oh, Des, which is the only way that he's going to get back in the league. Oh, Des. <laughs> If you're going to go sign someone that's been out of the league, I, I, I got to believe it would be Antonio. Brown. Josh Gordon, yeah, who applied for reinstatement again and is only 29. <laughs> you you want to play no, the I'm Josh not Gordon No, game? I'm not playing the Josh Gordon game. No, I'm not. Not at all. I, sh I feel like I just played it by mentioning his name. So don't, uh, don't worry about it. Yeah. All right. Dallas Goddard, the video is incredible. He was hospitalized after being sucker punched at a restaurant on Friday evening. Not good, man. Uh, there was no social distance between that fist and his face, and he mm. went out cold. It was a soccer punch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would be dead. Yeah, it was just another guy coming up in in this group of people Brutal. and just just yep. gets him on the chin. And uh, I think Dallas Goddard will not go into MMA after his NFL <laughs> days are done. All right, fair. Uh, yeah, I, I mean this. But the nice thing is, he's okay. Went to the hospital. Yeah. He's okay. Is is absolutely fine. Doesn't have any effect on the season. Dak Prescott signed his franchise tender. Both sides will have till July fifteenth to work on a long term deal. But this locks him in for the twenty twenty yep. season. Means that Dallas can't retract the franchise. Yeah, one in situation. Dak, Dak's not going to hold out. Dak will be there to play, which we everyone I think fully expected Dak to be there. So it's just this is just passing along the news. All right, let's talk a little post-hype sleeper situation here. Oh, my. Panthers offensive coordinator Joe Brady says Curtis Samuel, who was a uh, you know subject of lots of hype and discussion last offseason, says he's going to be, quote, critical to success for the team's offense. Last year, Curtis Samuel ran the most routes in the NFL. 
eighth most deep targets, 11th most air yards, 105th uh, catchable target rate. <laughs> those, so, those two things shouldn't go together. That's the down, I mean, that post-height much. sleeper, that's it's yeah. a real deal, right? No, it, it 100% is. Unfortunately, it's it's hard to really know what to do with Curtis Samuel. I think the player is very good. What's his actual situation, though? They brought in – the Panthers brought in free agent Robbie Anderson. Does that – move Curtis Samuel down to three, down maybe even four because Christian McCaffrey is on the team as well. Uh, and going deep, not necessarily Teddy Bridgewater's go-to move. Not, not, <laughs> not that it's he like can't. Alex Smith could yeah. do it, but he didn't love doing it. Yeah, so not that he can't. And I mean, Bridgewater's a very accurate quarterback, so we'll see. And then there was like weird rumors of him being traded. I mean, those kind of vanished as, as quickly as they started. But you you don't have to pay anything in your end in your fantasy drafts to take a shot at Curtis Samuel, so it's not impossible. Not impossible. Yeah, it's a tough situation to predict with the new offense there in Carolina. Yes. All right. Any other thoughts? Any other news you guys want to talk about? Nope. All right. Let's do it. Sleepers. You wanted me to be patient with the draw. Yes. You thought I was going to jump in before the finish. I knew you were going to jump in. I wasn't this time. Oh, you you were ready. No, I was good. All right. I was good, but I thought you had another piece of news for us. That's what I thought. Yeah, the, the news was Andy about to look foolish talking <laughs> over the music. <laughs> Why do I do that? Is that because on Spitballers podcast, sometimes yes. we don't have a finisher? Yeah. I mean, So that's your fault. Look. Consistency. It's it's not about consistency. The art does what the art has to do. <laughs> great, great. You, uh, that's such a great oh, that's response a good line. because you can't you can't critique art, right? No. I mean, it's, I mean, you can. The art but it's all does subjective. what the art wants to do. <laughs> I am the vessel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't handle it. I can't take it. Okay, well, let's talk sleepers. If you have the ultimate draft kit, obviously we have a bunch of consensus sleepers inside of uh, that wonderful resource. But today we are picking out, much like we did last week, with our, what, breakouts and busts. Yep. Mm -hmm. We are talking sleepers and values, and we're each picking one of our own today to talk about. Some other players that we want to surface to you, the Foot Clan, get you ready for the upcoming season. Do I have a volunteer that wants to kick this <laughs> thing off? I will kick it off. All right. Oh, all right. I am excited to talk about this uh, deep sleeper. Certainly not someone that uh, I think people are expecting to do big, great things. But that's the definition of a sleeper. Someone that is basically late or even undrafted that has an opportunity, has a pathway to really surprise and be fantasy relevant. My sleeper that I want to bring up is Boston Scott running back for the Philadelphia Eagles. That's a deep cut. It is a deep cut, and but l let me let me try to convince you guys that he's worth uh, a, a shot, even in a redraft league, at the end of your drafts. Um, right now, he's you know pretty much undrafted. He's a running back, fifty, one hundred and thirty fifth off the board. Philadelphia, he's a pass catching back. Boston Scott's a a, a little guy, five seven, one ninety seven, coming out of college. He was that Darren Sproles comp. Hold Philadelphia on. has. I got something you for you. I got something, something for you. Yeah. Hold on. Great Scott. <laughs> yes. Yes. That is fantastic. What? Well done. I am oh, very okay. happy to have that. Um, I will make Just sure in that, case that drop is, he does something, Mike. We've got it ready. Pressed again by the like end of it. this. Um, but look, Philadelphia has the ninth most vacated targets, eight and a half per game, which seems surprising. They lost a couple of ancillary pieces. Most of that was Nelson Aguilar, who's gone. And yes, that's addition by subtraction. But the point is, he benefited. Uh, Boston Scott did last year at the end of the year when there was a bunch of wide receiver injuries and they needed to find someone to catch the ball, move the offense, and Boston Scott came in and got the job done. And if you look now this year, Alshon Jeffrey's injured, Deshaun Jackson is older, Jalen Rager coming in is like, now people are saying, well, he's just going to be learning the Deshaun Jackson role. Maybe he's uh, the backup for that inevitable injury. <laughs> the the point is Boston Scott's opportunity here is actually pretty good because they do need to find uh, more ways to involve players in the passing game and 
they did not bring in a veteran back as yet. of uh, to this point yet. Um, but that's been a big contention of the, you know, we talk all this Miles Sanders. Is he going to be the guy? Is he not? Well, it's all a matter of whether they bring in a vet. Boston Scott's sitting there going, look, I was pretty good at the end of the year. He was like their offensive MVP over the last month or, or you know, certainly the last game of the year. Doug Peterson uses a committee approach. Okay, with the RB1 and RB2 both being relevant in fantasy. We saw that last year when Jordan Howard was doing well and Miles Sanders was still involved. In 2016, his running back two actually finished higher in fantasy than his RB1, and that running back was Darren Sproles. Darren Sproles is the comp for Boston Scott. In fact, the Saints drafted uh, Boston Scott to replace Darren Sproles. Hmm. And then the Eagles went and signed him off off their practice squad to replace Darren Sproles. He's he's literally trying to be that mold. And then he comes in, and in the final month of last year, he was Darren Sproles. He was the running back nine through that month, and that was while Miles Sanders was the running back seven. Both guys on the field, both being great, and here's the great best part. is that Scott. <laughs> yes. Uh, look, he, he <laughs> averaged 6.3 targets a game. And never fewer than six during that last month, which would be a hundred target pace. I'm not saying that's happening, but that is, he showed that he's a weapon. But you are going to say it. (laughs) No, no, no. I'm I'm not saying he's on pace for a hundred targets in, 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 in 2020. I'm saying that he proved to the team, like beat writers right now, they're saying that Boston Scott's a secret weapon. He's not fighting for a roster spot. He's fighting for more touches. He's locked in to an, an important role in the offense. So my point is you've got a committee back, a committee coach, a really capable guy who showed he can do it. If you're in a PPR league, I mean, even even when he had, you know, in, in that last month, he had one game where he totaled 19 yards, still had six receptions. Uh, you know, he would have ended up with eight points, and that was a complete bust game for him. So if you're in a PPR league, I think Boston Scott's a name you need to know and consider. Did you see the comments from Doug Peterson on the veteran – Running back situation about how they he feels like they, they missed, missed out. It. Yeah, I don't have the quote in front of me, but where they basically, you know, yeah, it was had their small, chance but, to sign a, a veteran and missed. Whiff. Yeah, that the, that veteran went somewhere else. So it, it almost certainly is Carlos Hyde who he's referring to. Not he didn't say him by name, but obviously Carlos Hyde was rumored to go to the Eagles and then went and signed with the Seahawks. Would you? delete your paragraph if they signed a veteran or would you maintain the sleeper status of of great scott if they were to go out and sign devonta freeman who's a very good pass catching back then boston scott would not be on my sleeper list um outside of him and maybe lamar miller uh, you know right outside of those two i don't think there's another veteran that would come in and take over the pass catching role that i think boston scott's you know they're they're going into this season with him as th- that role, that scat back. All right. Uh, I'm going to bring up Michael Pittman Jr. as my sleeper selection on today's show. Right now, he's being drafted as the, uh, oh my, I didn't even realize this, the wide receiver. And uh, my, if you don't know who he is, rookie wide receiver, Indianapolis Colts. Comes into a situation there with T.Y. Hilton on the other side and an opportunity for Michael Pittman Jr. to be the wide receiver, too, on this team. Couple things worth noting on the, you know, hype train. I'm going to try to build for Michael Pittman. One, uh, Frank Reich absolutely adores this kid. Uh, he's a contested catch master. If you look at Matt Harmon's reception perception, a um, lot of hype. He's a big guy. He can yes, he, he can come down with the ball in the red zone. Last year you had, you know, being drafted at wide receiver 55. I think is interesting because last year you had four rookies finish inside inside the top 35 at the wide receiver position. A.J. Brown was 15th, McLaurin was 27, Metcalf was 32, Slayton was 35. Pittman is being drafted well beyond any of those guys, and I think he's almost guaranteed to be one of the best contributing rookie wide receivers on this team. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but T.Y. Hilton's contract as of today, it's expiring after this year. Hmm. So Michael Pittman could be groomed to be their wide receiver one for years to come. And you have Phillip Rivers in the back in the backfield now at quarterback. And last year, the fourth most deep attempts in the NFL. We've seen what he's done with a very similar player, to, in my opinion. I think Michael Pittman and Mike Williams. Yeah, that's a fair comp. I are very similar. So right now, just where he's being drafted, 
And I don't know how you guys feel about Pittman. I think I, I think you like him. Oh, yeah, I love Michael Pittman. But I think he's just a value right now in drafts. And he'll probably rise if we see in camp that he's earning that wide receiver two spot. But such an impressive career at USC. Yeah, I like Michael Pittman. The situation does seem pretty fantastic for him. I'm not going to completely write off Paris Campbell yet, who who was he was a second round pick by the Colts last year. And like in Paris Campbell, even when you're talking about a sleeper, he is he's at least interesting to me because he projects to you know be a slot wide receiver, take those take the shorter routes that that we're we're, we're all projecting a bump for. Uh, for Naeem Hines in the passing game, a Paris Campbell certainly could be a player who sees a, a huge bump considering he... Yeah, we shouldn't forget he, about him. He did absolutely nothing last yeah. year. But yeah, he's... I like Pittman as the... He's their Debo. He could be their... He could be the... Uh, just an absolute touchdown guy like Mike Williams that year where he had the, the 10 touchdowns and not very many yards. Well, and his name is Mike as well. Oh! So, I mean, that's all you need. It's a great name. Decent. <laughs> all right. I'm going to give everyone uh, a break for me talking about Antonio Gibson for, for oh, this. But he is. I'm, 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 I'm warming on him. Yes. I, I, on I Antonio Gibson am, or on the player yes. he's about to. No, utter. no, Gibson. No, on Antonio Gibson. We just got to give him the, the obligatory yes. shout out. But I wanted to chime in and say, I'm, I'm starting to appreciate starting your to support. look for tickets. Look, all are welcome. Uh, and all are welcome on the Antonio Gibson hype train. Look, I just happen to have a first class seat. Like I'm in the front of the train. Yeah, because because first class on the Redskins plane is where you want to be. <laughs> Look, yeah, Between McLaurin gonna, and Gibson, you do have to realize that this offense has to be somewhere. It's gonna work. Okay, sure. That's that's the best argument Look, I've heard. Look, the Carolina Panthers last year with Kyle Allen had DJ Moore and Christian McCaffrey both verifiable for fantasy purposes. Washington could get it done. It can support those two players. But no, the name I, I wanted to go a bit deeper here. And yeah, this one, like Boston Scott, this is a very deep cut, but I wanted to bring up the name Randall Cobb. It feels kind of gross even bringing it up. Is this the same Randall Cobb from like 22 years ago? Yes, he's been in the league <laughs> since 1963. Okay. He's been around forever. But here's the deal. he was He's a new acquisition of the Houston Texans. They grabbed him after they traded away DeAndre Hopkins, and this wasn't just – a low-level veteran minimum contract. This was a three-year, $27 million deal. That's okay. Maybe that's inflated, but $18 million guaranteed for... His agent is good. He, he, look, maybe. Maybe he just has a great agent. But over the second half of the season last year for Dallas and his his quick stop there, he over the second half, he was averaging 70 yards a game. Deshaun Watson throws to the slot wide receiver position. 26% of Watson's targets last year, as far as I could find, went to the slot wide receiver. A lot of which last year was DeAndre Hopkins. DeAndre Hopkins saw a huge surge in slot targets because they just, I mean, they're moving around and they simply did not have that reliable player. Perhaps that's why they went after Randall Cobb. The, talk, you talked about, Jay, the, the vacated targets for Philadelphia. Well, how about the second most vacated targets? Because DeAndre Hopkins, who's gone, 150 targets that they have to figure out. Where are those going to go? Deshaun Watson's not going to disappear. He's going to throw for about 4,000 yards. He averages 26 touchdowns the past couple years. It's going to go somewhere, and this is an absolute – this is a complete shakeup of the wide receiver core. Who's the number one wide receiver for Houston? Probably Brandon, Brandon Cooks. Cooks. Probably. Probably Brandon Cooks. Maybe it's Will Fuller. It's, it's most certainly. Maybe it's David it, Johnson. Maybe it's Duke Johnson. Maybe it's. I'm hearing a lot of maybes. Yeah. Kenny Stills. Yeah, like, that's well, what it's I, definitely not Kenny Stills. But go, go on. Stop it. <laughs> uh, but that's, what, that's my point is that Randall Cobb could come in and see a much larger target share than anyone could possibly have imagined. He's, he's, he feels like old busted. If you watched yes. him, he's. Uh, I still think that he has juice remaining. If you watched him playing, he's, the, what, he's 29 years old. Yeah, I think he'll be that 30. Seems impossible. I think he'll be 30 when when the season starts. But he's he's interesting to me. We were it, we, and I'm saying we as like the universal, the the fantasy community. We were getting pretty excited for for Kiki in Houston, and that's because he was the slot wide receiver. We saw a huge target share when he was available in games and. The team is clearly moving on from him and giving that job to Randall Cobb. 
with such an ambiguous situation, Randall Cobb feels like a, a sleeper to me and someone who could pay off way, like way, way, way more than drafting than a last wide, pick in the draft. Wide receiver 70, where his current ADP is right now, which is just not, he's not being drafted. This is his 10th yeah, season. Wow. He, he is certainly not going. I, I think he beats his wide receiver 70. The issue is just how high does it go? And while I do think Randall Cobb will have good games when the inevitable injuries come down for, you know, the the Will Fuller, Kenny Stills, Brandon Cooks injury trifecta, um, you, know, you know, I don't I don't know about drafting him because I feel like he's the fourth or third on the team. But it is it is worth noting what you what you said. The money is real. And when you pay a guy, you involve monopoly. a guy. He had yeah, they, <laughs> the most yards per reception since his rookie season last year. And it's the most in his career at 15.1. 828 yards, 10 per target, which was the most since 2014. And he kind of just did it quietly and probably on no fantasy rosters last year yeah. for sure. It, yeah, I it think Aaron Rodgers made him a lot of money. <sighs> But Robert, well, yeah, I would say that I would say Dak year. Dak made him no, money I, last year. Yeah. My point is, I still think he's living off of yesteryear when he was this great number two next to Jordy. He only has and, one thousand yard season in his soon to be ten. Look, I'm not saying he's a top <laughs> ten wide receiver. Just saying you need to pay attention of somebody who might be a, t a target monster in Houston. I think the most compelling argument is the one you made with Kiki, where it's like you were looking at an opportunity in the slot. When Kiki is completely unproven, here they pay a guy to come in, and you have such an injury history around uh, the rest of that wide receiver core that it is an interesting name to bring up. Mm -hmm. Like he deserves to be brought up for sure. Value time? Value time. Jason's not going to be able to handle mine. <laughs> Values. He might not be able to handle my value pick, but I can handle mm. his. So I'll let him kick it off and get us in a good mood. Yeah, look, last year, this was a my guy for me. He's, he's someone that is perennially undervalued. And lo and behold, he comes back again this year and he is undervalued. undervalued. You talk about a, I mean, uh, Robert Woods. I mean, people just don't see the, the woods from the trees. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uh, because he is look sure, he's leading he's saying. leading the entire NFL right now in how many years that he is beating his ADP 7 years in a row Ooh. and granted some of that was uh you know uh, you know former bills time but 7 years in a row he has outproduced his ADP and it's going to happen again because right now he's being drafted uh, shout out to uh Rich Rebar on on that stat as well um He's being drafted as a wide receiver 19. And over the last three years, he's the the tenth the wide receiver 10 over those three years as far as total fantasy points. He is the number one wide receiver for the Rams. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that he's going to be uh, the number one fantasy option because he's not the red zone machine that Cooper Cup is. And so at the end of the year, Cup could very well outproduce him. But I, and I made this argument last year and you know it came came true. When it comes to targets and who is the actual first read and who is the wide receiver one, it is Robert Woods. And you saw this at the end of the season. At the end of the season, when they made the shift that has been talked about so much with the tight end involvement with Higby getting more tight ends on the field and and then Brandon Cooks and Cooper Cup were splitting time down in the you know, 60, 70% of snaps, Robert Woods never left the field. He was on there at all times. And during that time, you know, you, you look at those last eight weeks, the second half of the season, Robert Woods was the wide receiver eight. He was really, really mm -hmm. good. And what happened is it took him until week 14 to score yeah, a touchdown. Yeah, I was going to say, you got burnt, like your numbers of outperforming ADP do not match the emotional reaction of having Robert Woods last year and what you got I, in that first half of the year. I think that's his point is where he finished and the it, positive touchdown regression is coming. Yeah, I mean, the, the two previous seasons, he was on a 16-game pace each season of six touchdowns, which is very doable. For a guy that's basically, you know, 1,100 yards a season, he should be about six touchdowns. To get only two touchdowns last season was anomalous and hurt you in the beginning of the year. And because he got off to a slower start, 
His draft position is once again someone people just don't want, but he is a value. When you draft Robert Woods, you are getting someone who will outperform the wide receiver spot you are drafting. Guaranteed. I mean, it's it's yeah, I love locked Woods. and loaded to me. Yeah, no argument for me. Robert Woods, I have projected much higher than the wide receiver 19, as a, as is Cooper Cup. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to bring Ronald Jones' name up in the <laughs> in the value section of the show. I Jason, Jason's you, shaking his head. If he wants to, uh, <laughs> go go plug his ears or put on those noise. Go muffle. get some water. I believe Ronald Jones. Normally, you put the hate blockers on, don't you? Mm-hmm. Is it Ronald yes. Jones? Uh, listen, you're not gonna like this, Jace. <laughs> just in, just endure it. But Ronald Jones is being undervalued in fantasy football. His ADP is 80 overall right now. It's the running back 35. Last year, with Peyton Barber in the backfield, without Tom Brady in the backfield, Ronald Jones finishes the running back 26. He had an extreme, I mean, Tampa Bay has an extremely low running back market share. In fact, since 2016, the Buccaneers ranked first in passing yards per game, 30th in rushing. And yet Ronald Jones put up an RB26 season. Now, it was not a consistent, easy-to-predict year. Nobody is arguing that. What I am making the contention on is that Ronald Jones is being undervalued for the opportunity he has this year. Over 1,000 total yards last year, 4.2 a carry. Second best yards after the catch at the running back position in the NFL last year. He had runs of 10-plus yards on 12.6% of carries. That was fifth best at the running back position. Impressive. And his their, their general manager came out and said, look, he hasn't even scratched the surface on what he can be. He also said they have more faith than ever. Now, you could argue that that's not true because they went <laughs> and invested in Keyshawn Vaughn in the draft, but they let Pe- Peyton Barber walk. So that was one act of confidence in Ronald Jones in that Slowly. backfield. Slowly. He walked away real he walked, slowly. He walked away slowly. And look, we were talking, Mike, a little it's bit. It's a slight jog. <laughs> Peyton Barber, yeah, jogged over yeah, to Washington. Just... <laughs> your, your super team in Washington with Gibson, McLaurin, and Peyton Barber. But Ronald Jones, I, I am fairly certain, will have first and second down work for this team for the majority of the season. Now, if you don't think that's valuable in Tampa Bay, don't draft Ronald Jones. That's fine. I think it's more valuable than the RB35 spot. And if you listen to Bruce Arians talking on a conference call in March, he said, look, he thought that they ex- that Ronald Jones, while he excelled in the screen game, he can't use him at wide receiver. So when they went into the draft, they said, hey, we're going to go try to find somebody to be able to compete with Dare Agumbawale on third down and become a wide receiving threat. Mm-hmm. We know that Keyshawn Vaughn can do that. I'm not mm-hmm. expecting Ronald Jones to be a third down master in any way, shape, or form. But what I do believe is that first and second down in Tampa Bay is very valuable. Last year, Peyton Barber had six touchdowns. Ronald Jones had six touchdowns. Ten touchdowns is not outside the realm of possibility for Ronald Jones. He's being drafted outside right. the running back three range. So I think because of the Keyshawn Vaughn draft selection, there is a disproportionate amount of hate being thrown to Ronald Jones that does not, you know, the draft position is just too low for me. I think he's worth the shot. I think that he is worth the shot as well. And I, I'm not, I am not a Ronald Jones truther. I think that he is a limited player for the running back position because of his, uh, because of his hands. I mean, he is very explosive. He's really, really fast. So well, it's, it's funny, the hands thing too, because they won't use him. But we looked at this last year. He was much better than Peyton Barber in terms of catch percentage last year. Like he was Again, we're using Peyton Barber as, as the standard, which is a strong str- point. Strong a point. Strange place to be going. All right. The the player I want to highlight as a value, and this one is I think he is well, I guess he he basically missed the whole season. Did you so, buy your Ronald Jones jersey after that, Jason? I mean you Mike just did he, did cut he, off he, any retort, uh, but yeah, you you saved you. I thought he was just trying to save Andy from you know having me just bring up the the truth about Ronald Jones. Look, he, Ronald Jones. You say he's being drafted as the RB thirty five. I have him currently projected to be the RB thirty six. I was going to say you overdra- have to have him overdrafted. Right over there. Overdrafted. <laughs> so <laughs> clearly overdrafted. Hey, if you are taking him as the RB thirty five thirty six, I am fine with that in the sense that the, the what you're talking about and the opportunity 
to take over that first and second down roll and for Keyshawn Vaughn to come in and whiff on a pass protection or two. We've seen this with Bruce Arians and all of a sudden that rookie is getting a little bit of doghouse treatment and it's got to be the Ronald Jones show by de facto. There's no, you know, uh, Daria Gunbawale is not someone that right should be on the NFL field. Um, let me let me say this so too. Like we talk I a lot about Jordan Howard having shot. potential. I don't in believe it happens. Yeah, we talk about Jordan Howard having potential in Miami. And I would rather have Ronald Jones in that situation in Tampa than Jordan Howard. I think that's I fair. would rather have I would rather have Jordan Howard because Jordan Howard's a guy who's always gotten it done on the NFL field. A thousand yard rusher time and time again for good teams, bad teams. Um, many, many different I, I want the guy who I think is a good running back, who's uh, an NFL prototypical guy, and, and that's not who Ronald Jones is. Ronald Jones has had a couple flashes. He's certainly very fast. And it was that know, guy my, last my point year. is 172 carries, 4.2. I, f- I mean, if we're if we're if we're really standing on that 4.2, like whoop, this guy's <laughs> awesome. Um, I I just don't believe that Ronald Jones will beat out Keyshawn Vaughn when it comes to Tom Brady needing someone to throw the ball to out of no, the he backfield. Won't. He won't. And so I'm I'm avoiding Ronald Jones for the however many th- year in a row since he's been in the NFL. Third? Is it his third year? Yeah. Great. Se- two for second two. if you throw out the rookie year, which I choose to do. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is his, his second his year. No, no, no. They changed this, the back of the football card. I like it. It's his third year, but well, I'm just going to throw one of those years out. Yeah, he threw it out. I can do it too. All Mike, right. Mike, I love your pick. Uh, the value I want to bring up, look, in the in the 90s, right, we, we all have our – we're I'm talking to the older generation now. <laughs> We have our songs that in the 90s, they, they were our favorite songs. You wore it out. You listened to it over and over and over. And you kind of move on from it and you move down the road. And then you go back and you listen to the song. You're like, oh, yeah, holy crap. This, this is a great song. This song is an absolute banger. And you're like, yeah, I'm glad I listened to this song again. I had fatigue because I had listened to, to it so much in the past. And that is exactly to me what is going on with Deshaun Jackson, wide receiver for the Philadelphia Eagles. People want nothing to do with him for some bizarre reason. I, I, I guess if you want to come to me say with some bizarre with reason, the, he missed last year because of an injury. <clears throat> yes. Okay. F- fear. He, and he's, and he's 33. thirty-three. Okay. Well, he's thirty-three, but he was just traded for and given a contract extension by the Eagles last year. That is, it is not ancient history what he did. And in the one game that Deshaun Jackson actually played last year. Nine targets, eight receptions for 154 yards and two touchdowns. And you may say, well, who else? The Eagles wide receiver core was pretty banged up. No, everybody was there in that game. Alshon had seven targets. Ertz had seven targets. Aguilar had five targets. Deshaun Jackson was the target leader. And he, like, if you think that Carson Wentz is going to be a good quarterback, it's because Deshaun Jackson is playing for this team. And if you want to come at me with it, well, Jalen Rager, first round pick by the Eagles. Excellent prospect. I like Rager. I'm super pumped to have him on my dynasty team. Got a little bit less pumped when a few days ago I stumbled across this article where a quote from Doug Peterson saying on Jalen Rager, right now he's going to come in, he's going to learn one position, and he's going to learn from Deshaun Jackson, learn everything he can. Obviously, the playbook is extensive, and we just have to see what he has, what he, what he's taken from the off season to training camp. Once we see his potential and his growth, then we can use him in multiple spots. Once we see his potential, as in he is right now the backup for Deshaun Jackson. Is is Jalen Rager going to get on the field in the first couple weeks? It's Deshaun Jackson's job. They love him in Philadelphia. Back to one hundred percent. He, yeah, he is. He is healthy. Deshaun Jackson is all systems go for this season. He is a great player. He has not lost his speed. A lot of guys lose the speed at his age. If you watch him playing, you mean t- going into their thirteenth year in the National Football League, exactly. He is an outlier. You watch him play in Tampa Bay a couple years ago. You watched him in that one game last year uh, with the Eagles. He's still Deshaun Jackson. He still has it. And he might be the number one wide receiver for this team being drafted at wide receiver 62. Jalen, this is that situation that happens every year, a handful of them. Everyone will go draft Jalen Rager, and Deshaun Jackson's the better player. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Was that, a, prob- was that a mm-hmm or a groan, Jason? No, that was a mm-hmm. Uh. I totally believe in this as a value pick. De- Deshaun Jackson is left for dead because he's a 33-year-old guy coming off of an injury, but he's come off of injuries before, and, w- and we've seen – when you have speed like Deshaun ja- Jackson has, we've seen in you know in the history of the NFL, those guys don't really lose their speed at older ages. I mean, there's cornerbacks, you know, the best ones that play late into their careers because they just have that that speed card. So I, I like I like Deshaun Jackson. I think Andy's point of the fact that we always want the new piece over the right. you know people are going to be drafting Jalen Rager, uh, you know, a hundred out of a hundred times before they draft. Uh, Deshaun Jackson. He will go ahead of him in every single league. And then you'll be like, man, why didn't Jalen Rager score me fantasy points this week? <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Deshaun Jackson still exists. And we spent last offseason talking about what Deshaun Jackson means to an offense when he's healthy. And it was great for a game. <laughs> it was so. Yeah. Look, my <laughs> dynasty team that has Deshaun Jackson, that does not, that doesn't seem like the uh, ideal roster spot. Sure. Deshaun Jackson on a dynasty team. I'd love to see him bounce back. I don't think it's. You know, it's not unreasonable for somebody to want to avoid Deshaun Jackson because of the pains of last year, the fact that he is frequently injured. I don't think he's played a 16-game season since 2013. So you, you've you got a long run of getting banged up, which is amazing that he's maintained the speed throughout that time. And, you know, to Jason's point, like, Ted Ginn's just finally losing it, and he's like 35 and still probably pretty darn fast. Uh but I, I understand people wanting to avoid Deshaun Jackson in the same way that they might want to avoid Elshon Jeffrey, where when Jeffrey's on the field, Carson Wentz throws him the ball for touchdowns, but it's kind of it's – it's, it's a painful experience yeah. at times. Upside, man, of Deshaun Jackson. What's funny about that week one is – He was on my bench. Yeah, it was great. What, possibly that, but I mean – the world, the fantasy world, remembers that was the game that Terry McLaurin went five for one, 125 yards and a touchdown in his first NFL game. Over, overshadowing Deshaun Jackson's 154 and two. Like, it's so. Wasn't he the number one wide receiver on the week in yeah, week one? I would imagine so if with 150 yards and two touchdowns. It's just. That's it's the funny. last time we saw him. It's the funny how, it's funny how the, the narratives change over time uh, of the history of the season. I I still believe that Deshaun Jackson is a great wide receiver. Philadelphia still believes that he is a great wide receiver, despite the addition of Jalen Rager. And they're going to need him. If Alshon starts on the pup, the, as as an organization, they're saying we need Deshaun Jackson to be an important part of this offense come the beginning of the season. Well, and you should you should read a lot into the fact that complex playbook. Doug Peterson coming out and saying, look, he's he's probably not even going to start. In his rookie year. Yes. That should be moving your Jalen Rager expectations if the head coach comes out and says that. And then you combine it with a shortened off-season program where the teams are not on the field together every day, maybe very limited amounts of time to prepare. Not a great scenario for any of these rookies to go out and prove themselves if you need to prove yourself, which is what Peterson said. Mm -hmm. Now, the combined age of Mike's sleeper in value... Is impressive. Is ARP? Yeah, it's <laughs> yes. it's a combined twenty three <laughs> receiving seasons in the NFL, which is, but that's Look, that's the very, essence of forgetting somebody. Yes, because they're the old busted. They're, yeah. It's not the new hotness anymore. It's not the shiny toy. No, no, you're right. So, all right, let's do some mailbag. 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 Who? Who? Should have done it like an old man, like your, oh. your selections. <laughs> uh, third round yeah. reversal question. Michael in Columbus says, uh, where do you guys stand on a third round reversal in drafts? Does your preference change based on the type of league, dynasty versus redraft? So they're saying every three rounds you flip. No, it's just the first third. Wait. It's, when, it's once you get to the third round. It's a full flip it at just, that point? It just flips the whole draft because – and and the whole idea behind it is because the the weight of those first few picks, especially the first two rounds, it you mean like you just know historically guys drafted there have a much higher chance of finishing as a great fantasy player, and the further down the draft you go, the the lower the probability. That's people are pretty good at fantasy football. We 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 miss a lot, but we also get a lot right, especially in those first few rounds. So I'm, I mean, I'm fine with it, uh, but I don't think it's any type of mandatory decision. 
All right. Yeah, I, I agree. But it, to to answer specifically, they said, is there a difference in dynasty or redraft? That would only be for redraft in dynasty. You know, it should just be linear because once you're doing your rookie drafts, uh, I guess the startup is fine, but rookie drafts should always just be linear. Yep. All right, Jeff in Kansas City, what do I do with Nick Chubb in a dynasty league? Kareem Hunt is going to be eaten into the passing work, carries this year. Do I hold him for another year? Do I try to move him now? What would he be worth to you in the right deal? So what do you, what do you guys think about Nick Chubb long term? I think we all agree he's an incredible running back talent. In long term, I'm holding on to Nick Chubb. If if I'm trading him away, it's someone is blowing me away with a with a package of uh, of a usable player, probably multiple picks. Like Cream Hunt is there for this year, yeah. But Dynasty, I mean, you you can't just think about this year. You also have to think about next year. And I I guess let's put it this way, Jason: percentage chance that Cream Hunt is a Cleveland Brown next year? Eleven percent. <laughs> wow, very very low. So then I would I, I don't I I think you know if Kareem Hunt comes out and has a really crappy year, then maybe he will be able to be resigned by the Browns. I think if Kareem Hunt comes out and shows that he's still Kareem Hunt, which is what I expect him to do, then he will leave for greener pastures. Yeah, so I think Nick Chubb is still a really solid dynasty running back. Was that you predicting that he goes to like the Eagles or Yeah, I mean I I honestly think Kareem Hunt is is valuable in dynasty but i don't worry about him for nick chubb that much i mean nick chubb was still valuable over the the last part of last year and not as he's much a great not as, no obviously not as much but i mean he was still a solid fantasy running back and that was with the weird not being able to get it in from the goal line uh, into the end zone you know i i expect that to change i think with stefanski and the offensive line upgrades you gotta nick get Chubb's it gonna be the awesome you got it <laughs> Nick Chubb's going to be awesome this year. I don't. I don't worry. If you could trade him right now at a peak value, like like Mike said, if you could be blown away, if I could take Nick Chubb and you know maybe another little wide receiver piece or something, and change it into and and your in your roster allows for this with your running back depth, change that into like a Tyree Kill or a young stud wide receiver. Sure, um, then I'd be willing to do it. But I'm not looking to get rid of Nick Chubb. Yeah, you're not trying to take the Cream Hunt situation and motivate you to correct to make a big adjustment. All exactly. right, uh, if you have a question, by the way, you can go to the website, thefantasyfootballers.com, click the Submit a Question button. We also have a voicemail hotline you can dial, 302-464-TFFB. Before we close things out, I want to thank Pristine Auction for supporting the show. And a heads up over there on pristineauction.com, it is Give Back Week, and they are partnering with No Kid Hungry this week for uh, Give Back Week auction. Uh, Basically, it's June 18th through June 25th. There's a few more days left. And uh, this year, upwards of 18 million kids could face hunger, which is nearly one in four children in America. And they are working uh, by donating 10% of sales from this auction uh, to No Kid Hungry this week. You can go to pristineauction.com. When you register, use the code BALLERS. You'll get a $10 credit. And you can participate in their Give Back Week auction. That's pristineauction.com. That's it. We're oh, done. We We're did done. It. We we did it. We did another show. Oh, we How's did. How's it feel? Oh, they just like all the rest of them. <laughs> Feels great. <laughs> all right, Foot Clan, take care. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.